This is the fourth in our series uh, I, I'm calling Christianity 101. We're talking about what do Christians believe. Our teacher is the Apostle Paul in his seminal work, uh, the book of Romans. Uh, the Apostle Paul is building his case that all people stand guilty before God. In chapter 1, he made the case that all people can know there's a God just by looking outside at creation, seeing how things work so perfectly in our universe, there has to be a designer behind that. In chapter 2, he makes the case that all people can know there's a God by the fact that all human beings around the world have a natural tendency to judge other people. Something happens and you say about somebody, wow, what a scum. Well, where do we get that? Where do we get this sense that something's wrong and something's right? We all innately have a sense of right and wrong. And then behind that, for that to be real right and wrong, there must be a God behind that. Now in chapter 2, verse 17, uh, Paul begins his case against religious people. If you want to follow along in the Bibles, underneath the seats, it's page 1,128. Um, I'm going to make a, a bet today that most of us will be in the category of religious people. After all, we're here in church today. The religious people in that day were Jews. Uh, they believed they were served of God's favor because they were God's chosen people. They had God's uh, holy word. Uh, they were circumcised and they kept the Sabbath. But Paul is adamant that religious people are as guilty before God as anybody else. Uh, let me illustrate my point that we all stand guilty before God and we have no solution with a modern day parable. Suppose uh, you and your friends enter a contest and you win a cruise on Norwegian cruise line from Portland to Honolulu. So you're having a great time, and a fifth friend uh, comes and gets you and says, let's take a picture on the top deck. And so you all come up for the picture, and you're focused on the, the camera, and the, and the person says, I can't get you all in. Could you all step back? Well, what you don't know is that uh, this fifth friend has removed the railing and put butter all over the edge of the deck. And so as you step back, you all slip into the Pacific Ocean. So uh, my question is, as you're there in the water, of what is of use now? If there was any question about whether this person was a friend, uh, they laid that by, uh, or uh, they put that to rest by uh, quietly putting the railing back and slipping back into the buffet line. <laughs> they don't push the overboard, person overboard uh, thing and, and the ship shails off. So one of you is a, a, a wealthy person. You have lots of credit cards. You always carry a good supply of gold coins in your pocket. And you're shouting, wait a minute, I'm a first class passenger. Well, then nobody can hear you. Your status is irrelevant. In fact, your gold coins, they don't help at all. They just weigh you down a little more. Second one of you is an athlete. You do uh, triathlons. You're an excellent swimmer. And uh, you say, you know, um, I know you guys aren't, haven't been working out, uh, but I'm just going to swim off. I you know you won't be able to keep up with me. But you can't make it either. I mean, it's over 1,000 miles to Portland. And uh, it doesn't matter if you've swam from, you know, Florida, Cuba five times. You're not going to make it. And there are sharks. You know that. And hypothermia. I mean, you, you, you don't have any solution. The third one of you is an atheist. You don't believe in God. You're a secularist. And uh, you say to yourself, well, you know, there wasn't any purpose in life anyway, so I've just returned to the earth. And, uh, you know, I'd hoped I'd live a little longer, but that's the way it goes. You go down in anger, but you don't have any solution either. The fourth one of you is a religious person. You're up in the uh, control room uh, with the captain looking at the charts and uh, the map. You know exactly where the ship is on its way. And uh, uh, when they say, hey, come to have your picture taken, you kind of, you're unhappy about that. But you come out and, and uh, as you slip on the butter into the Pacific Ocean, you have a, four, a few choice words to share. You know, if, if you hadn't been so, you know, vain wanting your picture taken, we wouldn't be in this situation. 
Well, that may be true, but it doesn't really help. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, you have uh, knowledge about what's going on. So you say to the person swimming off, hey, you want to know where to go? You're going to go east by northeast. And uh, by the way, it's 1,319 miles to Portland. Well, without this person, swimmer had no idea how far it was. And Paul makes the case, the religious person <clears throat> lets us know our reality. We, until, before the religious person, you don't know how bad off you are. But you don't have a, a solution either. So look what we have here. We have a wealthy person. We have a, an, a, uh, an athlete. We have an uh, atheist. And we have a religious person. But none of them has a solution to the crisis. You're all in trouble. The religious person makes us, gives us kind of a reality check of, of how bad things are for us. But the religious person doesn't have a solution either. And that's Paul's point in this passage. Even religious people stand guilty before God. Even though you're religious, it doesn't guarantee that you're righteous. All of us, even religious people, stand guilty before God. Now, this isn't the primary message of the Bible, of the Christian faith, but Paul takes the whole first three chapters of Romans to build his case that we all stand guilty before God. Until we understand that, we aren't ready for his message. He's going to start here in another couple weeks of God's grace. Paul offers three reasons religious people stand guilty before God. First, religious people rely on what they possess. So Romans 2, verse 17, Paul uses eight verbs to describe religious people i've underlined them all for you now if you call yourself a jew if you rely on the law and boast in god if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. Uh, Jews stubbornly uh, believed that they would get a, po of, of all people, they would get a positive nod from God on Judgment Day because they were God's chosen people. They also counted on the fact that they were custodians of God's holy word. They were the possessors of God's special written code. Possessing the law is of no value, however, if we don't keep it. So Paul asks five rhetorical questions. I've underlined them. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? This is the same kind of case Paul made last week, if you were with us. He says, you who judge others, do you not do the same things? He's saying the same here now to religious people. Do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So his argument is the same as we saw last week. If you judge others, you admit that you recognize the difference between right and wrong, so you stand guilty. And here, if you're a religious person and you claim to be a teacher of the law, will you not be judged by that same standard? Just as Jews were proud that they were called God's chosen people and possessed the law, religious people today can be proud of what they possess. We can put our confidence in our upbringing, how long we've been Christians, our knowledge of the Bible. But if we do not obey it, it does us no good. Second, religious people rely on what they do. The Jews relied on their circumcision. A circumcision was the act of cutting off the foreskin of the male anatomy. It was a symbol that they were God's people. They understand it to be their passport into heaven. But Paul tells them that circumcision is no guarantee of God's favor. Outward religious symbols are of no value if we don't obey them. I'm going to start at uh, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 25. Circumcision has value if you observe the law. But if you break the law, you become as though you had not been circumcised. 
So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirement, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is a circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Paul is tackling the question of what constitutes a true Jew. Uh, Dan Ariely is a professor of psychology at Duke University. Uh, he was born in New York. Uh, at age three, his family moved to Israel. They uh, are Jewish. And uh, he lived there, and in his uh, senior year in high school, he was involved in a serious uh, a fire accident. He was burned 70% uh, of his body. He went into the hospital, and he was in there for three years. And uh, he was convinced that the way they treated his burns was irrational. And so he's written a number of books, but one of his most famous ones is... Uh, uh, the predictability of irrationality. Uh, so the issue he was wondering, so I just want to ask you a question. What do you think? Do you think it's better uh, to remove a bandage from a burn victim quickly? Get the pain over it? Raise your hand if you think that's the best way to deal with bandages. No hands? Hey, a lot of hands, first service. Um, or do you think it's better to take it slowly? How many? Raise your hand you think for that. Okay. So... Um, Dan had uh, constant arguments with the nurses. They took an hour to take off his bandages and he pleaded with them, please make it two hours. So painful. And they said, no, no, we know what we're doing. Quick is better. And so when he got out, he entered uh, uh, into the University of Tel Aviv and he made one of, a, one of his studies, uh, the treatment of burn victims. What's the best way to deal with them? And he learned that his nurses had been wrong. Taking off quickly is not the best way. So most of you are pretty smart. You guessed, right. Uh, that's not the best way to deal with burn, uh, burns. Um, and, uh, and the reason is we don't encode duration the way we encode intensity. If you can increase the duration, you can lower the patient's intensity of pain lower it greatly so that the patient has far less pain uh, just like we can be wrong about how what's the best way to remove a bandages from a burn we can be wrong in our thinking that we can do things to earn our way into heaven a gallup did a study two years ago found that 75 percent of people believe that they can earn their way into heaven by keeping the ten commandments I'm convinced that most people in this world think there are things we can do to earn God's favor. I've shared this illustration with you uh, several times uh, that I've used with you know, hundreds of people through the years. There's two ways to get to God, or so we think. Uh, most people think the way to get to God is spelled D-O. God's holy. His standard of per is, uh, is perfection. And uh, he, uh, we can't, uh, come into God's presence with our sin. But we think if we do something, we can climb the ladder and do, you know, do more good things than bad things. God will look at us and say, you know, you're not perfect, but you're doing pretty good. Come on in. But Jesus says that won't work. D-O won't work. The only way to get to a right relationship with God is spelled done. I died on the cross for your sins. I paid for all your sins. If you admit you can't do enough to earn your way into heaven, uh, I, I can forgive you of all your sins and you have a right relationship with God. Parents, discuss this with your children. It's easy for youth, even church youth, to get confused between do and done. Paul says there's nothing you can do to earn your way into a right relationship with God. He says a person is not a Jew who is only one outwardly. A Jew is one who has faith who has the Spirit of God in his heart, who is inwardly believes that Jesus is the Messiah. That's what constitutes a true Jew and nothing else. It's not the knowledge or possession of God's holy word. It's not the right of circumcision. It's not the claim to be God's chosen people. True circumcision is not outward 
physical mark, but an inward spiritual work of God. The only thing that makes a person a Jew is faith in Jesus as the Messiah. So Paul sums up the new covenant. New covenant is not something outward, like wearing a cross around your neck. It's something inward. The Holy Spirit comes in and gives you power and does change. Many Catholic and mainline Protestant churches have been hollowed out in the last six decades because they've stopped believing that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and that the Bible is true from beginning to end. Christian Smith, a sociologist at Notre Dame in 2005, did a, a study, examined the beliefs of American teenagers. And he found that most teenagers in America believe a mushy pseudo-religion he called moralistic therapeutic deism. He said there are five tenets to moralistic therapeutic deism. A God exists who created and orders the world. God wants, this is, in other words, this is what most teenagers in the United States believe. God wants people to be good, nice and fair to each other as taught in the Bible and most religions. The central goal of life is to be happy. God need not be involved in your life except for big problems. Good people go to heaven when they die. He found this is the belief of most mainline and Catholic teenagers in the United States. Evangelical uh, teenagers did better. Evangelicals are ones that grow up in churches that believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the only way to God, and that the Bible is true from cover to cover. But he says most teenagers in the United States have no clue what Christian faith is. He did a follow-up study in 2011. He found 40% of 18 to 23-year-old teenagers said their morals were based on the Bible or some other religious sensibility. He said that most teenagers may be religious, but they have no clue about Christian faith. Just like the thinking that removing bandages quickly is the best way to deal with burn victims, the thought that we can do something to earn our way to God is false. We all need to know that there's nothing we can do to earn God's favor. We're simply not good enough or consistent enough. We don't try hard enough, or even if we do try hard enough, we can't earn our way into heaven. This is a true story. A man went up on his roof to do some work. Jory's banned me from that kind of activity uh, now since I broke my wrist. And uh, he realized the pitch of the roof was pretty steep. And so he tied a rope around his waist, went over the top of the roof, and he asked his son, would you tie the other end to, a, to that tree? Well, his son looked at the tree and he said, that tree is scrawny. That's not going to work. So he tied it around the bumper of the car. Well, his wife came out, didn't know anything about the rope, jumped in the car, took off. This guy got pulled down. He was putting his trust in the rope, but that didn't work. Just like we can put our trust in that there's something we can do to earn our way to God, that won't work. There's a third reason religious people stand guilty before God. Religious people rely on what they do instead of what God has done. When you tell a religious person they may not be going to heaven, you'll get an argument. So in chapter 3, Paul uh, dialogues with the religious people who questioned his teaching. Three objections are raised. The first question is, what advantage then is there in being a Jew? They say, wait a minute. If we're the chosen people, we possess God's law, we, we're circumcised, and that's not good enough to get us into heaven, then what's the point of being a Jew? And Paul answers, what advantage then, or he asks the question, in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? And here's his answer, much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. He says, you've got a great advantage. You have the book. Knowing God's will for your life is a great advantage in living in the way he wants you to. Some of you have been given an incalculable advantage in growing up in a Christian family. Some of you grew up in situations where on Sunday morning, that's what you did. You went to church. That has given you an invaluable edge in knowing how to follow God. But you waste the advantage if you do not obey it and share it with others. The second objection people raised is, does faithlessness on our part nullify God's faithfulness? They said, if some uh, people uh, are, are unfaithful, does that mean God throws out all the Jewish people? 
all religious people? So Paul asks the question, what if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Then he responds, no, not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar as it is written so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. Even if everybody's a liar, God will remain true. Still a third objection is raised. If our sin gives God the maximum opportunity to show his grace, should we not sin all the more? This is Romans 3 verse 5. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some slanderously claim, that we say, let us do evil that good may result? Paul answers, certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Paul says to that argument, oh, please, don't be ridiculous. If God wanted us to do evil so he could show more of his mercy and goodness, how could he judge the world if he himself approves of evil? Suppose I go overseas and I buy an antibiotic, a powerful antibiotic. If you've traveled much, you know that you can buy antibiotics over the counter just about every country in the world. And so I come back and I'm not worried about getting a cold. Everybody else in Portland's worried, but I'm, I'm not. I've got this antibiotic. So I kiss my wife, even though she's got a horrible cold. I uh, share cups with my girls, uh, even though they're all hacking and coughing. I use any toothbrush I can find in the house because I'm not worried about catching a cold. You know, it's like I'm, 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 I'm you know, just kind of trying to get a cold so I can show off my powerful antibiotic. That's what Paul says. That's ridiculous to, 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 to you know, uh, su suggest that we should sin more so we can show off God's mercy. A Christian is one who trusts in Christ, not him or herself. Christian finds their security in what God has done for us, not in what he or she can do to earn their way to God. If you're relying on your baptism, your membership, how long you've been a follower of Christ, your attempts to live a good life or to help the poor, to earn good favor with God, you are misguided. All of us, even religious people, stand guilty before God. We fall short of his holy standard. We need a Savior. We need God's grace. We find that in Jesus Christ. Have you found your hope in Christ? Father, thank you for Apostle Paul's clear case that we all stand guilty before God and we need to understand that if we're going to see our need for his grace. If you have never admitted your sin and how far you fall short to God, you can do that right now and say, God, I'm never going to make it on the DO plan and I invite you to come into my life, Lord Jesus, and forgive my sin. I want to give you all a, just a, a, a few seconds to pray to God and to admit to him that your best efforts are not going to be good enough in God's sight. You pray. Lord God, thank you for your love in sending your son to die for our sins in our place so that we could be restored to a right relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.